Good morning. Everybody survived the Super Bowl, I see. Yeah, that's good. We're in a series called Following Jesus, and uh, we've been talking about how do you follow Jesus when you're being tempted? How do you follow Jesus when you feel like you have failed? How do you follow Jesus when more is being required of you than you are comfortable with? How do you follow Jesus when other things clamor for the right to be first in your life instead of making God first in your life? How do we follow Jesus when it comes to the words that we speak, how we think about our conversations? And uh, today we're actually gonna talk about how we follow Jesus regarding serving. Uh, Jesus did not tell his followers to watch me. He told his followers to follow them. And he didn't just say, see what I do. He asked them to also do what he did. So in, in Mark, the, the 10th chapter, it tells us, Jesus gives these words. He said, I did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This idea that service can actually make a difference in our world is a really big deal. Now, we all have ideas of things that we would like God to do. Right? For example, how many, if it were up to you, you would have God raise the temperature not to 40 degrees today, but to 78 degrees today, and there would be lots of sunshine, and a palm tree would sprout in your backyard. How, how many? <laughs> yes. So we imagine what God can do, but we also imagine how he would do it. It's one of the reasons why we often don't recognize an answer to prayer, is that God did what we asked, but not in the way we assumed or wanted him to do it. We assume that God is going to say something with the kind of force that's going to shake foundations and split mountains, or fire's going to fall out of heaven, or a troop of angels are going to show up. But the truth is this, is that there is a way that God uses to bring salvation to our world. And the way that God uses to bring salvation to our world is through servants. Through servants. Uh, in the ancient world, serving was, or, or most of the work was done by servants. If you had a lot of wealth or you had power, uh, you gave direction, you had ideas, you underwrote the cost of, but it was servants who did the work. Um, in our world, uh, there, there's a lot of similarity. There is a whole service industry. There are people who their job is not to produce a product. It is to serve people in some way. And uh, so let me ask you a question. You can think about this, right? So would you rather be the wait staff in a very nice restaurant or the customer in a very nice restaurant? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and would you rather be a flight attendant on an airplane headed to Hawaii or would you rather be a passenger on an airplane headed to Hawaii? Would you rather be the owner of a large bank account or would you rather be the bank teller? Now, the answer is easy and obvious in all of those situations, but what we often don't realize is our world would not work and we would not be able to enjoy any of it without people that provide services. It's essential to our world working and to our own health. Now, it's easy to confuse the concept between serving and slave. What's the difference between a servant and a slave? Well, for our conversation this morning, the primary thing I would focus on is that a slave has no choice. A servant has a choice. If you know anything of the history of the nation of Israel, they were enslaved by another nation. One whole nation enslaved by another nation. And they, they were slaves in Egypt. They were given tasks and assignments. And if they didn't get it done, there could be punishment or death. And so they didn't have any choice in the matter. But what's interesting is that when God sends Moses to talk to Pharaoh about releasing the children of Israel out of Egypt and letting them go to the promised land, he always uses the same language. I want you to let my people go so that they may go and serve the Lord. That 
that Moses doesn't actually say, I just want them to not be slaves anymore. He says, I want them to stop being a slave to you and start serving God. It's a really interesting concept. So God's way to bring salvation to us is to use servants. We may not know everything that God is doing, and, but we may have a sense that something could be done in the name of Jesus and in his way. Jesus actually understood himself in terms of a servant, that passage that I referred to in, in Mark's gospel. By the way, it's the, a version of that is included in every gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus pounded that nail as often and frequently as he possibly could. But there's a really interesting set of servant psalms you might not be aware of. They're tucked into the book of Isaiah. And Jesus frequently quoted from Isaiah and in fact identified with these psalms. And these psalms are interesting in that they foretold the servant that God would send that would be the Messiah for the rest of the world. So we're going to take a look at three of those servant psalms. The fourth one is actually two chapters long and it would take me two weeks to get through. And, and how many would prefer that I not, not uh, keep talking for two weeks all at once? One person. I'll just do it then and... And I'll bet at some point you change your mind. Yeah. So what's the first thing? We're called to serve with passion and gentleness. We're called to serve with passion and gentleness. Here's the psalm. It's found in Isaiah. It's 42. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break. A smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on the earth. Now this is really interesting. We're, we're, we're given a paradox here. We don't know how these two things can be true of the same person. Here's someone who has a passion for justice and is not going to be discouraged or stop until it occurs. But this is also a servant who is gentle. He doesn't snuff out even a smoldering wick. He doesn't break even a bent reed. Our culture, like most cultures, not only in the world today, but throughout history, equates gentleness with passivity. Like if you're being gentle, you must not really be passionate about something. If you're not screaming at the top of your lungs, if you're not tearing something down or jacking someone up, you must not care. That, that's how our world thinks about this. We equate ranting with passion. Ranting is not passion. Ranting is a substitute for passion. I can prove it. If you're passionate about health, do you just run around and rant against every unhealthy person you see? No, there's things that you start doing, changes you make in your life. If you are passionate about learning, do you just go around and rant against uneducated people? No, you actually start trying to enroll in a class, take a course, read a book, Go to a lecture. You want to learn something. If you are passionate about love, do you just go around and rant against lonely people? If those lonely people would stop being so lonely, then the rest of us could enjoy relationships. It doesn't make any sense, right? But that's exactly what the world does. With a kind of consistency that's a little bit terrifying. So this passage describes that our Savior, this servant is our Savior, and he's coming, and he will have a passion for justice. And justice is intolerable to him. He doesn't rest until it's, uh, until it's gone. So how does he bring justice? Not by screaming, but by serving through gentleness. It's amazing in our world how much self-serving and how much self-promoting passes for passion just because someone's excited and loud. Jesus refused to serve himself. He served his father and he served others. It's hard for anyone in our world to imagine that you could be passionate and not be angry. That's where our world is. 
The passion of Jesus was demonstrated in his love, not in his rage. We're constantly told in our culture that only the wealthy and the powerful can make a difference, but Jesus shows us that our world can absolutely be reshaped by gentle serving. It's a powerful truth. Jesus was the servant of all. He lived over 2,000 years ago. And, and one out of four people on the planet Earth follow him today. And it's hard to find anybody who doesn't know something about him. And all he did was serve. Uh, uh, secondly, uh, we're called to serve as a welcoming light. Didn't there be, used to be a commercial, we'll leave the light on for you? Yeah a hotel chain. This is out of Isaiah 49. It says, it is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those in Israel I kept. That's too small. That's an incomplete task. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. We're not called to try to be in the spotlight, we're called to be a light. I think sometimes that's why some people struggle with living out their faith, is they're afraid they're going to call too much attention to themselves. There's a phrase that Jesus used, it's really interesting, you find it in John 9, and he says, I am the light of the world. Now what's really fascinating is the story that surrounds that statement. It's found in John 9, and, and they, he and his disciples come across a man who is blind, what's interesting about his blindness is that he was born blind. And his disciples asked a really interesting question. They said, who did sin, this man or his parents? Their assumption was, if he's blind, he must have sinned. Now it is unclear to me what sin you can commit before you're actually born. A baby in the womb, what options does that little baby have? I, I can't imagine anything. And then if you are a parent of a child who's ever been born with a disability, it's very natural for a parent to feel some sense of guilt and wonder if they in some way contributed towards this. And this plays right into the way the assumptions our world keeps making that keeps piling on and grinding people to dust. And I call this blame blindness. The disciples were not only infected with it, they were carriers of it. Like one guy was blind from birth, but there were 12 disciples who thought that the only way things can be wrong in our world is if somebody sinned. And, and, and there's also another kind of blindness they had. It's a, it's a God blindness. They couldn't imagine that God would have any options in that circumstance. And what they were asking is who's at fault instead of asking, I wonder what God could do in this situation. That's a question worth asking. So Jesus declares he's the light of the world. And what's interesting about the statement is he said, as long as there's light in the world, people can work. When it's dark, people can't work. So what he's saying is, as long as I'm here, there's work that can be done. And he does an interesting thing. He spits on the ground. He makes a little clay paste. He rubs it on the man's eyes and he tells him to go and to wash in a specific pool. It's called Siloam, which this won't mean a lot to you maybe, but it was encouraging to me. The word Siloam actually means sent, which is our word for this year at, at our church family, because we're going to be a sent people. We're going to places intentionally and act as though that God has, has sent us there. And so he washes and he sees. And he starts telling a story, and some people who are religious and religious leaders begin to hear this story. They're known as Pharisees, and they were offended because Jesus did this work on the Sabbath. They just couldn't accept a miracle that happened on the Sabbath. So they actually pressured this man's parents to give misinformation to other people because if they didn't, they might get kicked out of the community. Can you imagine a religious leader coming to you and saying, I need you to lie about this, and if you don't do it, you can't be part of our church family any longer. That's what they were doing. And so 
the, the, the formerly blind man keeps telling his story and they keep asking him questions. And, and this is the challenge. Relig religious blindness can only see what God has done in the past. And if God does anything that doesn't look exactly like it did back then, they just can't recognize it. No one had ever been born blind and healed. There was no record of such a miracle ever occurring. And they just couldn't buy into it. So when Jesus heard about what had happened, all these conversations with the religious leaders, he actually goes and seeks this guy out. And he says, he's, do you believe in the Son of Man? And he said, the last time I was with that guy, I was blind. I've never seen him. You show me who he is and I will believe. And Jesus says, well, you're talking to him. And he falls down on his knees and he worships him and he says, I believe. See, darkness comes in a lot of forms. Keeping someone in the dark is, is secret blindness. Being in the dark is ignorant blindness. Having a dark side is motive blindness. Being in a dark place is hopeless blindness. Making dark predictions is pessimistic blindness. There's all kinds of darkness. And Jesus comes to heal our blindness so that we can see the light of him in our world and welcome others to see who Jesus is and what he does. It's a great picture. And then lastly, we're called to serve with resolve. We're called to serve with resolve. I was in college and uh, I was, had a roommate and, and uh, he was very good at chess and I am mediocre at chess on a good day. And uh, we would play often and, and he, I only, in our entire semester together, I only beat him one time. And actually I didn't know that I had beat him. I made a move and he said, why did you move there? And I said, it, because it's, it's the best option that I have. And he said, well, you have me in checkmate in five moves. The game's over. And he laid his king down and got up and walked away. <laughs> I won and didn't even know it. But one of the things he discovered about me is that I've got a little bit of a stubborn streak in me. And so I told him, I said, you can beat me, but I'll never give up. And he said, I will make you give up. I said, no, you won't. And there are rules related to chess. Like if you have one piece left on the board, you have a certain number of moves in order to put that person in checkmate or it's considered a tie. And so he left one more piece on the board than that. And he put me in a situation where all I could do is go back and forth. He'd go, check, and I move over here, check, and I move over here, check, and I move over here, check. And, and he said, you're going to give up? I said, I'm not. Check, 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 check. I just kept going. Check, check. Check at two o'clock in the morning, he gave up. <laughs> Some of you are not surprised. You go, yep, I always knew that about you, Pastor. You're, you're, you're that person. In Isaiah chapter 50, it says, I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. This is an amazing foretelling of what's actually going to happen, the torture that the Messiah will endure in crucifixion. And this was not a common, like crucifixion didn't exist in the world when this is written, but it would. Because the sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Because the sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I've set my face like a flint. I know I will not be put to shame. I wish I could tell you if you serve in any capacity that it will always be easy and everyone will always appreciate it. Don't get me wrong. There's, there's plenty of highlights. But there's also times when you may feel undervalued. There are times when you will feel appreciated. But also there will be times when... You get a sense that people are suspicious of why you're trying to help them. This was a foretelling of a kind of torture that Jesus would go through. And, and what it says is he will offer his back to those who beat him. And Jesus did that, but it didn't stop there. It also goes on to say there was mocking and there was spitting because that was kind of, that's what went along with the torture. And what it says here is the servant did not hide his face from that. He's being, dis he's being treated in a disgraceful way, but he is not disgraced. How is that even possible? And it says, because the sovereign Lord helped him. 
Hmm. We assume if the sovereign Lord was helping, what he would do is, is lock the jaws of people who are mocking and dry the mouths of people who are spitting and cramp the hands of people who are grabbing and striking. We are surprised to discover that the work of the sovereign Lord in this situation is actually internal to the servant. It's not what we expect, and quite honestly, it's not what we want. We are not disgraced. There's no grace in the actions of a person opposed to you, maybe, but that doesn't remove grace from within us. How powerful is that? So he set his face like a flint. Doing this implies that you actually anticipate opposition. You assume it's going to happen, but it's not just an act of stubbornness. Not only do you anticipate opposition, but you believe that the outcome is going to be different than the circumstance you're looking at, which means that you actually trust. You trust God is going to control the outcome you cannot control. Jesus did this in his life multiple times, the most notable while he's on the cross. He's being crucified. And he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. It's that trust. The outcome of this is in your hands. It's really hard to keep your commitments if you don't learn to commit your future to the hands of God. This is why we tap out. We can't see it working out any better than it is right this minute. And we don't want to endure a moment longer. It's all right to appreciate the moments that you're valued, and I hope you get lots of them. I'm going to ask the worship team to come out. Uh, I'm watching the Olympics these days. Anybody else? Well, ratings must be down, or <laughs> your lives are way more exciting than mine. <laughs> I do know this, I know no Olympic athlete actually starts on the podium. They start with basics. They submit to coaching. They adjust their nutrition. They build their stamina. Along the way, they fall. They fail. They get hurt. They have doubts and fears. But somewhere along the way, they learn to set their face like flint. Ask any gold medal or silver medal or bronze medal winner if it was worth it. I've never seen anyone just cast their medal aside and say it was a waste of my time. And it's not just because they got a medal. They discovered there was more to them than they realized in this journey. They discovered they were way stronger than they imagined themselves to be. They experienced breakthroughs along the way in the progress that they were making. They made friends, established relationships, went to places that they couldn't have imagined. It was because they set their face like flint. If we don't learn to set our face like flint, we don't just sacrifice our future. Our heart starts to get hard. And hard-hearted isn't anger, by the way. It's indifferent. We just stop caring about what's going on in the world. As hope kind of drains from us, so does compassion for what other people are going through. So these passages give us remarkable information. You've been called to serve. There's no one Jesus doesn't want on his team. There are no bench players in his kingdom. He's not picking from available people and he just wants the best players. He wants all the players because everyone makes a difference in the kingdom of God. So, are you a server? Because our world isn't going to be changed by our critical observations or our sarcastic remarks or our angry rants. But our world is incredibly malleable to people who step into dark situations with gentle hands and are willing to make a difference. We can be a light in dark places. 
We can serve with resolve. We can do the work of Jesus in the way of Jesus. So let's just bow our heads. A couple of quick questions for you. Are you serving others? Are you serving others? How do you define passion in your life? What blind spots are you contending with? What is it that, that keeps you from engaging? Are you easily discouraged? And I would invite you into the service of Jesus, in the way of Jesus. Father, you have not given up our, on our world. You've not given up on us. You've enlisted us in something that makes a difference. We want to serve you and we want to serve like you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.